Hello everybody, welcome here. It is Nicole of Sincerely Nicole Rose. I hope you are having a fabulous day and I'm so excited that you've tuned in to listen to my first podcast, which is so exciting. I thought long and hard about the name of this podcast, what it should be on, what I'm going to talk about and... One of the top contenders was the everyday extremist because I like doing extreme things like shaving my hair and moving a lot and starting my own business at 23 and things like that. But in the end, I decided up on Sincerely, Nicole Rose. And I decided on this because it's been my brand for years, like literal years. I came up with it when I was 16 in high school. And I absolutely love it because sincerely, it speaks of authenticity. It speaks of, it's how you end a letter, sincerely yours, which is such, I love it. I love how they used to end letters in like the Jane Austen Regency era. It's just so beautiful. And I chose to adopt that as my brand. And when it came to doing this podcast, I just decided like, you know what? I have to stick to who I've been for years and I can still talk about things that are the everyday extremist, but at the same time, I don't have to make that my brand. So I love talking. It's number one for me. Anyone who knows me knows I can talk the hind leg off a donkey. My family tell me I've been doing this since I was a toddler, since I learned how to say mama, dada. <laughs> um... And I figured it's time to talk the leg off a different donkey because shame, the people in my life, they have to listen to me talk all the time and have so many opinions and I have so many thoughts. I'm a deep processor. I'm a deep processor. I'm a deep thinker and an external processor. So what I put out, I've genuinely been stewing on for a few days. And Jamie, girl, I just want to say... I'm finally putting the rants online. Jamie is someone I lived with for four years and we used to have rants in the kitchen all the time. And she would come to me, she'd be like, Nicole, you need to put these online. And I'd be like, oh, I don't really want to. Like, I don't feel like I have anything that that's valuable to say. No. And I would make excuses and I'd be tired and busy and I didn't want to do it. And then I just decided I was driving someone home the other night and they were like, yeah, what's stopping you? And I was like, I don't feel confident enough to do this. And she just encouraged me, reminding me that how I had explained to people confidence was a choice. You can't start until you've started. So this is me. This is me starting. I I ended up going on a rant on my Instagram the other day, explaining, someone asked me a question about confidence. They were like, oh, you seem so confident how do you do it? And I'm just going to explain my answer here and I'm going to re-answer the question because it's such a great question and so many people have it because confidence is such a big part of so many people's lives. So let's, let me answer that question. So when I was 12, 13, my parents bought me this book called God Girl and it was all about becoming a woman who is after God's heart everything you do is for his glory and it it was such a great book and it it had this chapter on shyness and I know you don't look at me and think oh my goodness she's shy that's like that's what she is you would be wrong internally I am actually a very shy person I am very I get very nervous talking to new people for the first time going into situations where I haven't met like the whole group, group situations even just make me nervous in general. And the chapter of this book that spoke about shyness basically said that feeling social fear and like feeling nervous about social environments is natural. But when you allow that, when you allow shyness to define who you are and define how you react to situations, that's when it falls into the category of sin. And 
it was like mind blowing for me because I'd go to youth every Friday and I'd sit in the corner nice and quiet you know no one has to talk to me I don't have to talk to anyone I'm there that's what matters and literally the next like the next couple of lines in the book were like you know shyness is a choice so is confidence and if you practice confidence enough eventually you'll get to the place where confidence becomes natural and now I'm way more confident than I was when I was 13 (laughs) I hope so it's a decade later but I know who I am I know who I belong to I am confident when I walk into a situation I know what topics I enjoy talking about I love getting to learn more about people and I don't feel like dissolving anymore and being like oh can't do this I do sometimes but I now have years of experience where I can step out of that and be like hey confidence is a choice and like I'm constantly making the choice to be confident I'm gonna do it again yay wasn't that a great rant because I love speaking about this and I want to encourage everyone who's listening to this podcast who would mark themselves as shy have you made shy a part of your identity because I had And let's be honest, it didn't belong there. It had no right to belong there. It was something I made into an excuse. The behavior before I knew wasn't, it it was controlling me. And anything that's controlling you, we need to bring to the foot of the cross and we need to bring to the Lord and say, Jesus, this is what I have I feel shy. I feel scared. I don't want to talk to people. What if they reject me? What if, what if, what if? And we need to get into the word and see what the Lord says. We're supposed to love people. Is it loving to sit in the corner because fear is holding you back? And I don't say these things lightly. I I have anxiety. I understand. It can be overwhelming. It can be terrifying. But is fear your master or is God? And you're going to have moments where you mess up, but it's okay because it is his kindness that leads us to repentance. Once we've messed up, all we can do is repent. You don't need to play it over and over in your head hundreds of times, guilting yourself for acting differently to how you wish you'd reacted in that situation. That's not the point. The point is to know that, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry Please forgive me for allowing fear to rule me in that moment. And I forgive myself for making that decision and allowing fear to rule me. And then from there, when you get into that situation again, seeking the Lord and saying, okay, Lord, I'm going into the situation. Please give me courage, give me strength and give me the words to say and show me who I should talk to. And you know what? If you are someone who struggles with shyness, find someone in the room you can talk to. Find someone you know, someone you're comfortable with and start with them and preferably someone more confident than you and then go to them and say, hey, why why don't you invite someone else into this conversation? I'm really, I'm nervous and I don't know how to do it, but I know you know lots of people. So would you bring someone in for me so that I can meet someone new and build up my confidence? And To all the confident people out there or to the people who have made the decision to be confident, look out for the people who tend to isolate themselves, stand in the corner. They generally want to be involved. They just don't know how. They don't know how to come up to someone and say, hi, and start a conversation. That is really intimidating for a lot of people. And I can tell you from experience, walking into a room, finding the person who seems to be on the side and talking to them is something that will generally encourage them a lot. Most people don't do that. You stick to your circle. Don't. (laughs) Talk to someone new. And find that person who you think could be speaking to more people and speak to them. People are fascinating and they're amazing and you can never go wrong by just talking to them and learning more about them. Okay, I feel like that rant went on forever, but it was worth it. It's something that like when you're typing it out on an Instagram story, you only have so much space and you know people are only going to read so much. So I tried to get as much as possible in there, but I feel like this explained it way more in detail and way more in depth 
Now, there was something I actually wanted to do today because it is COVID-19 season. That's the best way I can say it. Um, So an elder in my church wrote an article called Going Viral and I found it super encouraging. So I want to read this article. It's um, by Sean Brideseth. It's called Going Viral. Viral, you can find it on the 412global.com website. And I want to read through it and then just talk about a couple of things in there because it's really encouraging and it has some very encouraging practices that we can do during this time to Yeah, I'm I'm not gonna skip ahead, I'm gonna read. So this is going viral by Sean Brideseth. Excuse me for looking off to the side, but I have to read it. Father Damien, a Belgian priest, arrived on the island of Hawaii as a missionary in 1864. Less than 10 years later, he volunteered to serve at Kaulapapa, an isolated settlement where more than 800 lepers had been quarantined and a place very few people wanted to go. There among the lepers, he birthed built a church building, served as a priest, dressed residence ulcers, built a reservoir, built homes and furniture, made coffins and dug graves. My fellow believers, he would say every Sunday as he began his sermon, naming the thing they all had in common. He worked among them, lived among them, embraced them. He did this for more than a decade. One day, he realized he'd burnt his foot with scalding water but hadn't felt it. It could only mean one thing. That Sunday morning, he stood up in the meeting, took his place behind the pulpit. My fellow lepers, he began. The prospect of getting sick is a scary one. Opening a new site today, and more than half of the top trending stories are dedicated to the spread of the coronavirus around the globe. People are being quarantined, while huge sporting events are being played in closed stadiums or outright cancelled. We're nervously listening to accounts of people travelling back into our home countries from abroad. People who seem to be displaying signs of this potentially deadly virus. One person showed symptoms, report the news outlets, but they're being treated in isolation. Not to worry, it's contained. Hang on. They were traveling with others who are now showing signs of carrying the virus as well. Two people, three, six, seven, suddenly a cough is not just a cough. A high temperature is not just a high temperature. Panicked people are buying items like safety masks in bulk. Contagion, a 2011 Gwyneth Paltrow museum, movie about a mysterious virus that originates in Asia and spreads around the globe, killing millions, has seen a massive surge in online views, rentals, and downloads. Don't touch your face, experts are telling the public, even though thinking about not touching your face makes you want to touch it more than ever. It's quite alarming, really, and many people are living with anxiety at the deadly virus that then that can be passed from person to person without being able to stop it. And in the middle of the hysteria, the question again arises, what are the people of God supposed to be thinking, saying, and doing during this time? Christians have an interesting relationship with bodily sickness. Some will adopt a stiff upper lip, suffering through affliction and feeling that we shouldn't bother God with such things, especially since He no longer heals people like He did through the apostles and Paul. It's more fatalism than faith. It allows a person to avoid the disappointment of asking God to intervene and seeing nothing happen. Others, in an opposite but equally problematic approach, will declare that we should positivity, positively, con, positive, <laughs> we should positively confess healing and wellness, and it will happen. They will invoke the line, "Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it in, as it is in heaven." From the Lord's Prayer in Matthew six verse nine to 13, asserting that there is no sickness in heaven and so there should be none on this earth, even though there is evidently no marriage in heaven, but we're hardly advocating for that here. 
below. Surely this is a misreading of Jesus' prayer, which instructed us to pray for God's will to be carried out as it is in heaven, not for the end results of his paradise to be forcibly manifest in every way right now. It's an imbalanced approach and will lead to disillusionment when it fails to work. As with most things about God, the answer lies in the middle. He can and does heal, but not always. When he heals, it's because he has healed. When he doesn't, it's because he hasn't. But one thing can be sure, it's always God's plan to heal us of anxiety, fear, and panic that persistently accompanies health threats. Viruses may war against bodies, but anxious fears wars against our souls. The people of God have never ever been promised perfect health, but we have been promised perfect peace. You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast, wrote the Old Testament prophet in Isaiah 26 verse 3, because he trusts in you. Earlier in the same body of writing, he stated that one of the names for the Son of God would be known by Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9 verse 6, knowing that lashing Sorry, knowing that Prince of Peace was the reason Paul could list his floggings, sufferings, near-death experiences, lashings, beatings, stoning, shipwrecks, danger, toils, pressures, and concerns in, Corin- in 2 Corinthians 11, 23-29, and yet still begin the letter with the words, Grace and peace to you, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter invoked the same greeting of grace and peace in both of his letters, despite being told definitively by Jesus that he would be martyred as an old man. Imagine knowing without a doubt that you would die a violent death in your twilight years and still carrying grace and peace with you. That's not normal. Even death, that final most formidable formidable enemy, has lost something of its power. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? cried Paul to the saints in Corinth, quoting the prophet Hosea. Therefore, my brothers, stand firm, he went on in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Let nothing move you. At his father's funeral in 1928, the Welsh revivalist Evan Roberts erupted the somber eulogy, This is not a death but a resurrection, he said. Let us bear witness to this truth. Paul urged the church in Thessalonica not to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Indeed, the people of God have a different perspective of sickness and death, not because we live in denial of reality, but because our eyes have been opened to the highest reality. So we've been told to wash our hands, which is something we've been told to do since we were children and should have been doing anyway. To the delight of manufacturers of hygiene products, we're being told to take soap and water and wash our hands regularly for 20 seconds. This is good advice. We should follow it. It would be foolish to simply live unwisely and expect to remain healthy. We've got to find the balance of trusting God while taking precautions. But I think we should also be washing ourselves spiritually to take precaution against a far more dangerous virus. For those feeling the understandable panic that comes with an unseen pandemic, causing pandemonium around the world, we should wash ourselves with the word of God more than the word of the internet, calling on him for what he has promised us, peace amidst the chaos. Our lives are in his hands, not the hands of the government's border controls. We should wash ourselves with the promises of God, but not the promises of an affliction-free, healthy life, because that is unbiblical. No, we should wash ourselves with the promise that he will be our God, not fear, not anxiety. Last time I checked, he was still in charge, still sovereign, still working on this earth, and still delivering people, not only from physical sickness, but also from every fear that tries to make itself a God in his place. And so, every trial is not only a tragedy, but also an opportunity. The coronavirus is scary, no doubt, and every measure possible should be taken to prevent it from spreading further. But it's also an opportunity. 
It's an opportunity to let it be known that the God, that the people of God are not blown back and forth this way and that way by fear of what is seen. Rather, we are anchored by a God of what is unseen. Okay, so I know that was a mouthful. Imagine it for me. I had to read three full pages of single, well, it's not single space, it's 1.5 paste words. But I really wanted to read that to encourage you because I know a lot of people don't want to go and read a three-page article themselves. But I especially want to comment on this paragraph over here where Sean speaks about washing ourselves spiritually. So on my Instagram story, I'm trying to do this as frequently as possible, but I'm just trying to ask people how they are, what's going on, how was their day, simple questions like what did you have for lunch, was it a good day, was it a bad day, if it was a bad day, why was it a bad day, tell me your highlights, tell me your lowlights, just simple questions you'd ask over a dinner table with people and at the end of these questions I've been asking people, one, did you read your Bible today, two, what did you read, three, how did it encourage you? And then four, what can I pray for? Um, and I think those are really key questions to bring into every part of this situation. That we are washing ourselves in the world. Like wash yourself in the word. Sorry, not the world, the word as much as you are washing your hands. Um, as much as you gravitate towards hand sanitizer gravitate towards towards the word of God memorize psalms this is something I've done and w- as someone with a terrible memory I can vouch that it's possible pick the short ones I'm laughing because man I have a bad memory but pick the short ones and start there it's as easily said as it is done um I started with Psalm 142, which is really great. Um, the first like paragraph, I'm actually going to say it now. It's something that's so encouraging. With my voice, I cry to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy. I bring my concern before the Lord. I lay my trouble before Him. I mean, how... I, I memorized this when I was in a different different season where I was struggling and I just needed the Lord to be my comfort. And even now it comes back and it encourages me. Bring your concern before the Lord. Lay your complaint before him. He is God. He is interested. He wants you to come bringing your petitions to him in prayer, trusting that he is a sovereign, faithful God who will do what is best for you in every situation. And sometimes that means not answering our prayers. But who am I to decide what was good and what wasn't good? God is the only good and he is the epicenter of that in our world. So that was what I wanted to encourage you with. I want to encourage you to get into the word. When you're feeling scared, you're feeling discouraged, you're seeing this pandemic played out over mainstream media where even I went to checkers the other day, funny story, and I saw a lady, the bottom of her cart was filled with canned goods, and the top part of her cart, she had like five toilet papers in there, and this was before Cyril's speech. I was dying. I had to clamp my hand over my mouth, walk to another aisle, and literally canned myself. I laughed. For five minutes straight, I thought it was hilarious because we don't need to be crazy. We don't need a hoard toilet paper. We don't need a hoard hand, hoard hand sanitizer. It's just about looking after yourself as best you can and not living in fear where if we don't have all the canned food in the world, we're going to starve to death. Calm down. I'm not saying don't be wise. It might be a good idea to have a little storage part of food, but you don't need 50 cans. Eight will do. We're not going to run out of food. That much, I guarantee you. Maybe I should be more careful in saying that much, I guarantee you. But we don't need to live in fear of running out. 
We don't need to hoard toilet paper. If people are smart, they ration, they look after what they have, it's not going to come to how bad the worst people are imagining. So my encouragement to you is be wise, be thoughtful towards the least of these. And in that, if you purchase all of the toilet paper, if you purchase all of the canned goods, what about the people who are working that day and can only come shopping at six in the evening? What about them and their family? Do everything you do in consideration to others. And I encourage everyone to do this because it will come full circle knowing that in humility we haven't put ourselves first. We're following the commandment gave us, God gave us, which is to love our neighbors. And by loving our neighbors, we consider them high value people in our lives. Knowing that if we take everything, there'll be nothing left for them. So we won't take everything and we'll leave knowing that it'll bless other people and make this something we can all get through sustainably by caring for the person next to us as much as the person in the mirror. So I hope that was encouraging. I'm actually really happy with how easy I found it to talk for a long period of time because I'm going to be honest. I was really nervous. I wasn't going to have anything to stay, to stay, to say. Sorry for the notifications. I forgot to mute my computer. But yeah, that's that's my encouragement to you. And I'm just going to, I'm actually going to pray us out of this podcast and Thank you so much for tuning in. I still don't know the frequency or how frequently I'm going to be doing these, what they're going to be on at the moment. I just want to come on and, yeah, share what I feel to share. So, Lord Jesus, I thank you that we could come together digitally and be encouraged in your word, in who you are, in your sovereignty. And I ask that in this situation, you will put the least of these on our hearts. People who, people who maybe don't have the same privileges we have, can't afford what we can afford. I ask that you will fill us with love for the world and you would show us how we can serve our communities and serve the people around us. Show us how to show love and kindness to the people around us and fill us with a love for your word. Yes, Lord, speak to us through your word. I pray for every single person who listened to this podcast. I pray that your hand will be on them, your mercy will be over them, and I just ask that you bless them. In your name we pray. Amen.